Did I switch? Do I hit that button? Yeah, I think you switched it. Did I switch it? Am I on? Let me come look. Hold it, everybody. This is new for me. Yeah, we're kind of, this is new, so. Did I do it right? Be nice. Yeah, I think okay. I can see you. Hi, everybody. Let me check your <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay, hang in with me here. Fabulous. Okay, girl. Welcome to my home. Welcome to my office, actually. If I knew how to move the computer, which I don't, I'd show you around my office and you would see what this mad, madhouse is that I work and live in, but welcome to what you can see. And I, I extend that welcome to people all over the world because there are people in I don't know how many countries joining us today, tonight. It's night where I am, evening where I am, morning where some people are. I know Joyce, it's the middle of the night for her. and. So I, I am grateful to all of you, and I embrace you all as we begin Reflections, a summer school class. And I, I love the idea that I had this and that you're all here, so thank you. And all of you, I, I'm sure, are familiar enough with my style to know that I love to enter a class with a prayer and exit as well. So I've chosen a prayer to kind of get us all breathing together that is um, from John of the Cross. So, I will not sacrifice my soul for all the beauty of this world. There is only one thing for which I would risk everything. And, and I don't know what that lies hidden in the heart of the mystery. The taste of finite pleasure leads nowhere. All it does is exhaust the appetite and ravage the palate. And so I would not sacrifice my soul for all the sweetness of this world, but I would risk everything for an I don't know what that lies hidden in the heart of the mystery. John of the Cross. Now, I couldn't imagine a better prayer meditation to get us started in a class on intuition, a subject that I thought would be so perfect because intuition is what started me on my path. And I thought I would actually begin with a story that uh, of an experience that happened to me way, way back in the 80s when I first began as a baby medical intuitive. And it was one of those experiences that um, inspired me not to do, not to do one-on-one -on -one readings anymore, but to teach intuition, the nature of intuition. And I didn't know then, and this actually was probably the late 80s, I didn't know then how much I would come to know about intuition or understand our intuitive nature. Um, but this experience is worth the telling. And that's that at the time, I was a uh, I, I, you have to understand that I was learning medical intuition without a teacher. There weren't any medical intuitives in the early 80s. I was it. And thank God for my beloved friend and mentor and partner, Norm Sheely. Because without him, I, I don't think I would have ever even pursued this skill in me because I didn't have any interest in it. My whole life was... <laughs> was about trying to become a great fiction author. And I don't have any talent for that, so I'm still trying to do that. But anyway, um, but I have a genius as a medical intuitive. And so I, I actually would do these workshops and do medical intuitive readings. When I think back on this, I cannot believe I ever put myself through this, but I would do medical intuitive readings on every single person in the workshop. And there would, some, there would be 60, 65 people. And I would do these intuitive readings. And I can still see these. I can still see this. And it would, I would be there from Friday evening, all day Saturday, and all day Sunday. I mean all day, from 9 to 5. And I would go through every one of these people. And by the end of Sunday, I was, I'm telling you, I was a dish rag. And, <clears throat> and I would go home back to the publishing company. And I was I was shattered. I I was absolutely shattered. And I and it never occurred to me, why are you doing this? I I was in my 
early, mid-30s. I was just getting my sea legs. It never even occurred to me that I could say, that I could challenge this. And I think, in a sense, that's how grace works, because grace is that kind of funny, funny force that keeps you not realizing that you're burning yourself out. But anyway, I was learning. I was learning how to be good at what I do, and at what I could do, I should say. Then one time, as I was doing these readings, there was a woman in the class, and I said, what could I do for you? And she was so arrogant and so defiant, and she sat there with her arms crossed across her chest, and she said, I don't know. You tell me I paid my money. And I, I was so shocked at what she said to me. I was so jolted that I, I sat back, and I mean, I was standing in the middle of the, the, the uh, seats were set up around me like a circle, and I sat back, and I, I got, in that moment, it's as if I came into myself, and I walked up to her, and I asked the person sitting next to her if he would not mind if I could sit in that chair. And he got up, and of course, nobody, nobody in the room could figure out what I was about to do, strangle her or what. And I sat next to her, and I looked at her, and I said, I am going to sit here next to you until I can figure out a way to thank you for what you just said to me. Right now, I can't but I'm going to. And I just went into silence because I, I, was, I, I realized I felt that I had reduced myself to a circus act, which was never going to happen again. It was a moment of sublime humiliation. And then I realized I would never, ever position myself that way again but that my role was to teach. And what I understood in that moment so deeply, and it was the only way perhaps that teaching could get through to me, was that I served no one by doing those readings. Because when a person is, when a person is given a reading, they have the option to dismiss, to, to treat the, the intuitive as if they were entertainment. But if I, as the teacher, it, um, ignite in you, connect in you, your intuitive abilities, help you to recognize the myth of what is an intuitive voice from what is not, help you to recognize that you have been in touch with your intuitive voice all along, then what I have done is wired you in the most authentic way possible. And that took place over 20 years ago in a small little, little basement of a church in upstate New Hampshire. And since that time, I thought that I have been committed to teaching intuition, but definitely not doing those intuitive readings, though I, I admit to doing medical intuitive readings to help people, but that's a different story and we're not going there. Well, later in this series of reflections, we'll talk about in a later session that you as a, your own medical intuitive, but tonight we're now going to pursue on intuition. I wanted to talk about intuition for another reason, and that, you know, to give Context provides content, and that is the way I see things. So to give you a larger context, I think that it's important for everybody to actually really understand that we're living in a different universe now. There is nothing about our world that is anything like the world of our elders, especially if you're in my generation. But if, if our we live in a psychic world now. We live in an energy world. We live in a world in which we have to understand that we are primarily multi-sensory now. And this is, uh, you know, with every generation of people who are born, 
today. They are increasingly, um, uh, their interior senses are increasingly alert. They are increasingly um, sensitized in a way that we were not, and certainly our elders were not. They are increasingly, and, and, what, and one of the trigger points, by the way, is that we are living in a world in which we are taking time out of all of our equations in life. Now, this is part of what is the most difficult thing to explain. It's something I understand so deeply, but it's part of the most difficult thing to actually explain. Um, and it's like the technical end, the mechanical end of intuition. Intuition has all these mythologies, all these, it's kind of like this mysterious, like what is intuition? And actually all it is, is perception without time. That's all it is. It's the capacity to perceive instead of to see. It's the capacity to perceive data that has not yet incarnated into matter. That's all it is. That's all it is. It's the capacity to sense and interpret what you've just sensed and make sense of it. That's all it is. That's it. But what this data is that you're sensing is data that has yet to incarnate into the experience of physical matter which is becoming time. Now, I know you might think, now what is she talking about? But it's the difference. Um, think of this. It's the difference between what the internet has done, what the email has done for communication versus the post office and mailing a letter. Email has essentially taken time out of communication. A letter takes, used to take two days. An email takes two seconds. The difference between an email and a letter is time. We've managed to take time out of the equation. That's the difference between the information in the physical world and your intuition. Your intuition is an email. And physical information is a letter. And that's how you understand the difference. That's it. You don't turn it into something spiritual. You don't turn it into anything that has anything to do with a vegetarian diet. It's got nothing to do with any of that. It's simply, it's as simple as it's only data that hasn't incarnated into anything physical. And what's important for you to understand is that we have evolved now into a world, into a society, into a civilization in which all things are functioning on email timelessness. All things are immediate. Change is rapid. Our senses have are expanding, our multi-senses are expanding organically. It's just happening. Fifty years ago, um, when 50, 30, 20 years ago, when, when the idea of intuition and developing intuition was was very novel and very, um, uh, it seemed like something someone chose to do. The attitude was that it was like a, a, like learning a language, like I'm, I'm going to go learn French and I'm going to go learn Spanish and I, well, I'm going to go learn intuition. And I remember uh, Norm Sheely and I doing these classes on developing intuition and I, it, <laughs> oh my God, when I think of it, and I said to Norm, how are we going to do this? I mean. How, how on earth are we going to teach people to be intuitive? And Norm said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll have them do some meditation and we'll have them 
sit under a pyramid and we, oh, he came up with the most outrageous things. And I said, I'm not telling anybody to sit under a copper pyramid, Norm, I can't do this. He had him walking around his farm with orange glasses on and I, I cannot even tell you. But the long and the short of it is that so many nonsensical ideas and theories it developed in our, in our uh, the consciousness movement about how intuition evolves in us. And we're going to deal with those in a few minutes. And so far as I'm concerned, they're all nonsense. But that's me. And of course, I do know what I'm talking about. So we'll get to what's real and what's not real. I just want to emphasize at this point that we are living in the intuitive era. And that's not nonsense. That's real. And our multi-sensory nature, our nature, our what you might think of as psychic nature, has been awakened. Not because it's a spiritual thing, not because it's a gift. It's simply organic. And it has nothing to do with being a highly evolved person. It has nothing to do with what you eat. It's evolution. And that's it. You can jam the circuits. We're going to talk about that. But the best way to approach this is to understand this is just the time of evolution in which we're living. So, oh, and I want to add one other thing. Another reason why it's important to really take a very impersonal, almost evolutionary look at this is that um, without an impersonal look, approach, what people do is they mythologize. They start thinking that there's something special about getting an intuitive hit, that there's something special about them, that that an intuitive hit, they start embellishing and using their imagination to embellish things. They don't understand how their own intuitive system works because they start projecting spiritual mythologies into it or angelic mythologies. They start making up things. And that's where it becomes dangerous. That's where it becomes, I must be special. There's nothing special about you. That's the way nature works. If you understand nature, and that's the doorway we're going into, going through, I should say. So with that in mind, I need a, an image on the screen of a building, if I could have a building. Ah, this is an image. I, lo I love this. I just say things and they happen. And, and that's the way it should be in my life. So I need a pizza. Does that happen? No. OK, later. This building image, uh, simple though it is, is going to be very useful. And we're going to use this throughout summer school. Um, so memorize it, kids. This is you. And this is the perfect analogy. Because buildings don't move, but you move inside the building. And that's exactly the way it is. And when you look at the building from the outside, there's no telling where someone is on the inside. They could be on any one of the floors. And that's exactly the way consciousness is. There's no telling what floor someone lives on. Now, we all start out on the first floor. And just like the analogy to a building, every floor you live on, as you rise in the building and you move up a floor, the next floor, the next floor, the next floor, the view of the world you live, you see around you gets more spectacular. The person who lives on the fourth floor of a building sees the neighborhood very differently than the person who lives on the first floor. In fact, they don't even live in the same neighborhood. If they described the neighborhood they lived in, you wouldn't know they lived in the same building. And the person who lives in the penthouse She's an incredible vista. They see the rivers and the mountains, and the person on the first floor wouldn't even know they live near water. And yet it's the same address. And what's true is each floor, as you go up, it gets more expensive. 
it gets harder to live and afford the taxes as you go up on each floor. So it takes a lot more effort to afford the floors as you go up on them. They get more and more costly. And that's true too. And that's just the way it is in consciousness. As you rise up these levels inside of you, it gets harder and harder to sustain the floor in many ways. And the way it works is that the vista becomes more and more spectacular, more and more out, absolutely incredible. But as you grow, go up the floors, what, let me say it this way, from the lower floor, floor one, floor two, your physical senses, your eyes, your ears are incredibly useful. That's when you need your physical senses because you're very, very close to the physical world. You need your eyes to see the ground and you can hear the sounds from the world. You can smell the fragrances from the world. But as you rise up, pretty soon these senses become useless. Their, their capacity to see what's down there and identify it clearly begins to diminish. They can no longer hear what goes on very clearly. You can't hear anything. You can't smell the fragrances from the street. In other words, the useless, the reliability of your five senses to accurately call the shots in the world that you live in, as you expand and see more of it, diminishes. Your other senses, your interior senses, are the ones you need to rely upon. Your intuitive senses have got to take over where the limitations of your physical senses leave off. When, when your sight, when you can no longer identify clearly what you're looking at, you have to shift from seeing to perceiving. From hearing to sensing. Your intuitive senses are the ones you have to rely upon as you ascend on the floors. These are a different sense, set of sensory skills. They are, they are, you are meant to work in tandem with each other. Your intuitive skills are not meant to eclipse your five sensory skills but they are, they are meant to work in harmony. They're meant to, it's kind of like a hybrid car. You run, on a, you run on electricity until you need the gasoline and then it just kicks in. They work as a team. They're, it's not one or the other, they're both and they're built to work as a team. It's not one or the other. But they do perceive differently and they retrieve different type of data and what they retrieve, the type of data that they retrieve has a very different consequence on your interior life. Your sight, your physical sight does not necessarily have a transformational or mystical consequence, whereas your inner sight might ignite a transformation. Wait a minute, I have to sit. pause. You can do this too if you want. Just a minute. Okay, back with you. Um, now how it works in this building is that all of us start out on the first floor with our, you know, running around and, and learning our way around the tactile physical world. And when, you know, on the first floor we all think this is our whole universe and we see just out one window. We see the world as we want to see it. And for a lot of people that's just fine, but then what, ha and here's what's true. We are all programmed, it's inherent in us, it's built into the journey that we will want to get out of the first floor. One day it will simply not be enough for us. 
and we'll find a staircase and we'll run up that staircase only to and discover that there's another floor. And what happens every single time we find the staircase to the next floor is we'll always get this sensation, this feeling, this deep knowing that if I move to the next floor, if I do this, my world's going to change and, and maybe the people on the first floor won't talk to me the same way and maybe, maybe, maybe it, everything in my life is going to change and yet the draw to see what's next, to see, to see the unknown is so, so compelling to, to pursue an I don't know what that lies hidden in the mystery is so strong in us that inevitably we will go to the next floor. And then you get to the next floor and you see a larger vista and you, you have to adjust your sights. You have to adjust what you thought was true. You may have thought, for example, that you just lived on a block because that's all you could see from your window, only to discover actually you live in a neighborhood. And then when you go to the next level, the next floor, you discover you actually live in a state or you actually live in a borough or you actually live in a country and by the way there's an ocean and so and so and so on. Now what happens is on this inevitable trek as we move up the floors, with each time we move our senses are adjusted. The way we, we grapple with the world, the way we engage in our environment is jolted, adjusted, recalibrated. And our sense of what is true and what is not true goes through the laundromat. Because on every floor, what was true on the third floor doesn't join us on the fourth. Because according to the third floor, the way I looked out the window, I didn't see that, for example, where I live in Chicago, we are, we're on Lake Michigan. And let's say on the third floor, I didn't see any lake. So, so as far as I was concerned, I didn't live in a city that had anything to do with the lake. Then I moved to the fourth floor, and now I can see the lake. So here's the point. So far as I was concerned, I didn't live near water until I moved to the fourth floor. So suddenly, my whole world had to adjust. And everything I thought was true about where I lived suddenly became untrue. Now, for a lot of us, for a lot of people, this journey up from one floor to another becomes very, very frightening. Because what intuition is all about is not a gift, not an inherited thing from your grandmother. It's not about any of that. It's about your capacity to sense receive, respond to truth at the speed of light. It's your capacity to receive information. It's not if knowledge, data that is absolutely accurate, that is truth, and not have to reshape it because you you are you want you don't want to live near a lake. You want the world to be just like it was on the third floor. And so in order, in order to go back to that, you have to tell yourself a story. I really don't live near a lake. I really don't. Instead of looking east to Lake Michigan, I want a house that only faces west and there's no lake on the west side. 
and therefore I still don't live near a lake. I need an apartment that only looks west of Chicago and there's no lake there. You see, it, it, intuition is about getting a quick gut response that fast and able to say that is absolutely the truth instead of getting something and saying that's too fast for me. I can't, I don't want truth that fast. I don't want it that fast. What happens to us is that every, one, every time we go up on a floor, our whole world adjusts and we, we have to settle in. We have to get used to the vista. And the journey of that floor is all about recalibrating the speed at which we can respond to a new level of truth. So we get up to a floor, for example, and let's say on this floor, the way the world looks to us is nothing like we thought it was. And on this floor, we find out that, um, here's, a, here's a basic example that really is so easy to relate to. What if you were a map maker and you thought the world was flat and you finally reached a floor where you saw that the world curved? But your whole economy, your whole world was based on making flat maps for the flat world people, only to discover it's round. You don't want to go any further. You don't want to go up any further on the floors because now it's costing you. And it becomes very frightening. But I will tell you something. Just as you were about to go up that floor, you, as a flat map maker, your intuition was telling you, prepare yourself. What you're doing isn't accurate. Prepare yourself. You're going to get news. Prepare yourself. You're not, the world is not the way you thought it was. Because whenever we're doing something that's not right on target, our intuition always, always, always begins to pulsate inside of us and tell us that the way we are moving is not accurate because what intuition is all about, and here's your operative word, is truth. It's always about truth. So every time we move up a floor, what happens, I just want you to imagine, is that a pulsating force comes through that says everything that is not truth is going to get cleared out here.